It doesn't matter if you have six months worth of fat stores on you. When you get into a fasted state, your body is going to have a stress response activated. Okay, and it comes down to a very simple thing. Okay, if you are fasting, you are in a survival mode as far as your body is concerned. Okay, if you were an animal and you were just fasting, but you didn't have the will to live and the will to go hunt, you would pretty much just be a floppy pancake that would be there for a grizzly bear to eat, right? You're not ever having this like oomph to go do something. So it's normal to get a stress response with cortisol levels elevated because that's what's stimulating you to go find food. It doesn't matter if you have plenty of storage on hand or not. The same response applies. I'm gonna teach you how to use data from that to make the best decisions with fasting. After this video, I want you to check out Eight Sleep. When it comes to data, and it's gonna be very relevant in this video, Eight Sleep is amazing, okay? So think about all the data points we like to look at. Heart rate variability, respiration rate, heart rate, all this stuff can be monitored while you're sleeping with a very specific mattress topper or what they call the pod, which is a mattress itself. I use the topper just because I like my mattress and I didn't want to get rid of it. But it's really cool because I get up in the morning and I can check where I'm at with my heart rate variability. I can check what my respiration rate was and it's pretty darn accurate. Like I cross-reference my data with my continuous glucose. I'm a super nerd with this stuff, but it's also a heating and cooling topper or mattress. So that means that it can regulate and determine how hot it is outside and cool your mattress a little bit so you stay in the right cycles of sleep. Not to mention it tells me what my REM sleep was like, what my deep sleep was like, how many times I woke up, how much I was tossing and turning. Honestly, it is money well spent. They are a sponsor, a supporter of this channel, and I'm on somewhat of their advisory board and kind of help them out with stuff, especially as it pertains to fasting and everything like that. But there is a link down below that can also save you some cashola if you want to try them out. So that link is down below in the description. Make sure you check out Eight Sleep after this video. Trust me, you won't regret it. So in order to take a look at heart rate variability, cortisol, we have to look at this study that was published in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition. This looked at a 48 hour fast, okay? Now a 48 hour fast is a little bit more extreme than what maybe just the regular average Joe is doing, but it still shows us the data. Now, it's interesting, if you look at the chart that's popped up on the screen, and I've shown this in other videos before, day one, you have the normal spike in cortisol, okay? But then it kind of comes down just because you're at the beginning of a fast. So there's no real you know, stressor. But day two, cortisol levels spike in the morning like they're supposed to, and then they just stay elevated. Okay, well, that mm, is a good thing when we're fasting because it's what we want, but we don't necessarily want chronically high levels of cortisol. And then it kind of like goes down a little bit on day three. Okay, what's interesting though, is that most of us aren't doing like regular 48 hour fasts. I know there are people out there, but the vast majority of people fasting are doing intermittent fasting where they're fasting for less than one day. So you might be looking at this saying, well, I guess I'm not gonna have to deal with a cortisol issue. Well, the cortisol issue comes into play with repetitive fasting. There still is a cumulative load, okay? So like when you look at how much you fast and how frequently you fast, sure, eventually you're going to end up having elevated levels of cortisol because that is going to become a pattern of caloric deficit. Now, you can't always look at your cortisol levels. What you should be looking at is your heart rate variability. Now, this same study measured heart rate variability, and I'll explain what that is and why this is applicable and why you should probably be looking at it and also give you some sort of uh, pragmatic solutions here. Okay, if you look at the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition study, you find that heart rate variability goes along the same trajectory as cortisol does. When cortisol goes up, heart rate variability goes down. Now, what is heart rate variability? Quickly in a nutshell, heart rate variability measures like the intervals between your heartbeats and it sort of measures the variability in between those. So if you have just a little bit of variability kind of in between, then you're gonna have low heart rate variability. If you have high levels of variability, you're gonna have high heart rate variability. We want higher heart rate variability. That indicates that we are ready to repair. We're in the parasympathetic nervous system. We're in the rest and repair, rest and digest mode. Okay, if our heart rate variability is low, we are in much more of a stressed sympathetic nervous system response. Like if we're sleep deprived, if we're starving, if we're super stressed out, if we're nervous, right? But the nice thing is heart rate variability gives us a bigger picture and a lagging indicator of what the previous days are aggregating to now. Whereas like even testing your cortisol levels in blood or saliva form are going to tell you just a snapshot in time right now. It doesn't necessarily tell you what you were at 
days prior. So I like HRV because it's that lagging indicator. I kind of compare it to measuring your HbA1c when you're looking at glucose. It's like a bigger picture of where you stand kind of in a few day period. So what you will find is if you do longer fast, your HRV, your heart rate variability will drop because you're stressed out. So your recovery goes down and that's kind of a given. We don't like to admit it, but it is a given. When we fast too much, we stress ourselves out and our recovery goes down. So you can use your HRV data to know like when the best time to fast is, when the best time to not fast is. And I've talked about that in other videos too, but people have been asking like, what is the right HRV number? Well, your number is gonna be very specific to you, okay? It makes a lot more sense to compare your own bio-individual HRV data to your own data in time than it does to compare it to a universal value. What I mean by that is, if I went out and sprinted right now, and I measured my HRV tomorrow, and I saw that my HRV uh, went down dramatically, I'd know that sprint was a stressor to me. If three months from now, I do that same sprint, and I don't have the same HRV drop, in fact, my HRV goes up, then I'm saying, okay, that is a great indicator that I have adapted well, and that is a data point in time that I am looking at. Whereas, if you start looking at universal values, you're gonna throw yourself off, so compare to yourself. And the other thing is that my HRV usually sits between 80 and 90. My wife's sits between like 100 and 115. That doesn't mean that she is a more relaxed person than me. That means that that is her value, I have my value, I compare my relative data to my own relative data, and she compares her relative data to her relative data. So don't compare yourself to others, but you can use HRV to determine, okay, am I getting uh, too much fasting in? And again, since we look at the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition study, we see, okay, cortisol levels and HRV go, uh, or HRV goes down, cortisol goes up with a 48 hour fast, but not so much with a 16 or 24 hour fast you can kind of compile your data by looking at your HRV if you're doing a series of 16 hour fasts. So maybe two 16 hour fasts per week don't lower your HRV, but maybe three do. And then you find that that's your tolerable upper intake. And then, so maybe me sitting here preaching that you shouldn't fast more than four days per week could be incorrect for someone like you because your sympathetic nervous system, your parasympathetic nervous system activation as measured by HRV could be a very powerful indicator of where you personally stand. And then what I like to do is use HRV as a tool to know when I can add more stressors in. Okay, so what I mean by that is, if I have been doing 20 hour fasts consistently for you know, three days a week for a year, a 20 hour fast is probably not gonna lower my HRV very much. Well, I could look at that as a good thing and saying that I'm adapted to, stress, uh, adapted to the stress of fasting, but I don't look at it like that because I always want a stressor. I do want my HRV to drop a little bit because that indicates that I'm getting something out of it and I'm stimulating cortisol, I'm stimulating hormone sensitive lipase and I'm stimulating those beta-3 adrenergic receptors and I'm stimulating the fat loss that's gonna occur, right? So in that case, I say, okay, well now it's time for me to either bump up the hours of fasting or it's time for me to add additional workouts in during my fasted state to try to increase the stress load. Or maybe it's time for me to add more caffeine so I get more of a cortisol stress response. The point is, I have to change that. And then there will come a point where maybe that's too much and I need to back it off, but it's all relative data. So HRV is probably one of the best tools that you can use to determine how much fasting you should do and how much fasting you should not. Okay, again, it's all relative data. Compare it in time. Do not compare it to a universal value. You're gonna drive yourself crazy. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.